keeps things pretty well insulated. Um, so that's 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 kind of a neat thing to know is that hey, I get a few more degrees of heat that other people might not uh, take into account when you get the weather report on the daily news. Um, the other one I wanted to find out was how much chill do I really get? Uh, and it turns out not a lot. So I don't get very cold, but I wanted to get some trends on on chilling hours and how much heat I got and found out that I hardly get any heat, <laughs> hardly any chill. So um, that's something good, good to find out. So you really have to keep running your station for you know a few seasons to kind of get some some trends there. Uh, the other thing I, I, I wanted to do was uh, I installed an automatic watering system that uh, gets its data from some weather service. I wasn't sure what, but I figured, you know, if I'm contributing to uh, a site like WeatherCloud, Weather Underground, you know, maybe it would then pull it into this other app that was then feeding back into whether it decided how much to water my yard. Uh, and that would be kind of kind of neat, close the loop there and, and be able to... Um, you know, really fine tune my my yard's watering. Uh, uh, the other one, you know, being able to make zone comparisons. So I found out that uh, in the last five years, I've hit 32 degrees once, and that's that's pretty awesome. Um, so I don't get any freezes. Um, they do happen every few years, but but not that often. And so you know, even you know, a mile away, there's uh, there's freezes. Um, Get below freezing and so that that helps uh, make some good decisions on what plants I can actually grow and which ones need to be in my greenhouse. Um, the other fun thing is now that uh, there's a whole bunch of internet connected sites that will plot and track and store your weather data for years and years uh, for free, um, like Weather Cloud, Weather Underground, uh, you can you know, track it and not be doing anything. So I set it up and I haven't touched it in um, my latest weather station. I haven't touched since January and it's just going. You now, once it's set up, it's it's very low maintenance. So those are all the kind of reasons, you know, why, why I wanted the weather station. I mean, other people may have other ones and this is really focused on my, uh, you know, home backyard experience. I'm not a, not a large scale farmer. I don't have acres, just a you know, normal city lot. Um, so how did I get to the uh, solution I'm gonna present to you guys? So I had did a bunch of research and saw that I really liked the Davis Vantage Pro system, but that was like way outside my budget, $600 plus for the system. Um, that was too much for a beginner, you know, as far as uh, how much uh, I was willing to pay. Um, I was going to get a cheaper one. Then I happened to go to the Santa Cruz flea market and I, I found a really cheap brand new in box one. Uh, um, so that's what I started with. Uh, so it wasn't connected to the internet, but because I'm a software person, I decided to make it connected to the internet and uh, built a little computer that would uh, transmit weather data. And that was great, but uh, it kept breaking down and it was ugly and it was super technical and nobody else was going to be able to do it. So um, once that station died last year, I decided to look again, try to find something that was easier, uh, super low effort, and try to keep the costs down as well. Um, I wanted it to be online uh, because I want this to do the tracking, and I don't want to be I want to be able to view my weather from anywhere. So you know, if I'm traveling for a week, I want to know you know how hot is my backyard. Do I need to call my parents and say, hey? come over and water today because, you know, it's been super hot or something like that, you know? So uh, with the system I have now, I can view it from anywhere, literally anywhere in the world. I can look at my weather in my backyard. Um, so this is what I came up with. It's a company called EcoWit. Uh, they have a modular system, which means that you can buy as much weather station as you want or as little weather station as you want. And that was kind of appealing to me um, as I don't yet know uh, how big I want to go. You know, if I put in another greenhouse, I might add some more sensors for that. But, uh, you know, right now I'm just tracking the basics. So this is a, a view of my weather station in situ last week. Um, my backyard is kind of overgrown with uh, lots of goodies right now and potted plants. And my pond's kind of empty and... 
Um, lots of green, lots of green, lots of bananas. So um, keep that in mind as I continue on. Uh, weather station. So the reason I like this weather station a lot is the cheapest you can go is 50 bucks, um, which is really, really great for an intro system. So $50 gets you uh, the sensor gateway and the outdoor temperature sensor. Um, don't buy the indoor one like I accidentally did the first time, uh, but that worked out because I'm now using it in my greenhouse. Um, and then I also added in the wind and UV sensor, rain sensor. Um, so that has brought my system up to 150 bucks, um, approximately, depending on you know sales and all. Uh, but you can get this as little as $50. So anyone can do this. There's not really an excuse anymore. You know, if you got a spare $50 laying around, you can have, you know, the basics, you know, outdoor temperature and humidity. And because it's modular, you can always add these things in later. Um, the nice thing about this particular system is you can have eight temperatures throughout your yard. So you can have like eight outdoor sensors or a mix of indoor and outdoor. Um, you can have a whole bunch of other sensors that I don't even know what to do with, like, you know, leakage sensors, uh, CO2 sensors, air particle sensors, leaf wetness, all kinds of stuff. Um, so I like the fact that it was extensible, something that I could build on uh, as I continue to grow my yard, my interests, and, you know, kind of want to figure out how to, how to track things. Um, so costs, uh, besides the actual system, there's, there's mounting. Um, so they recommended using like a metal pole for mounting it. I happen to have a spare two by four that was laying around. And so I uh, stuck that in the ground and put another scrap piece of wood on top and uh, made my own mounting solution. So that didn't cost me anything. But I think uh, if you the metal poles they suggest, you know, it's just a single metal pole. They have comes with clips to clamp on. I think it's about 20 bucks. So that's the other potential cost. Uh, in the answer to Rob's question, he asked, uh, is the battery wired? It's battery powered and wired. So the outdoor stuff is all battery powered. Uh, if you use lithium ion batteries, those are gonna last a really long time. So years. Um, I think some of the units like the the UV sensor is actually uh, a solar solar cell. And so that's measuring you know, the amount of UV light coming to your yard, um, but that's also powering up that, that particular module. Um, and the base unit that connects to your home Wi-Fi, that one is powered via USB. So any, um, you know, like a USB charger that will charge your phone, you could use that to charge it. So you might have some of those laying around. I think it came with one. Um, yeah, I think it came with a power supply. But if not, you know, $5 gets you a USB power supply. Um, yeah, and your, your Wi-Fi needs to be on all the time. So this is a solution that uh, is going to require you to connect it up to your home Wi-Fi. And it's going to be streaming out this data, you know, literally every five minutes um, to various services to make sure you can access it from anywhere. Um, so the gist of the system is the gateway. It's this little box that connects up to, uh, to USB. And so it's a little micro PC. Um, it's USB powered, connects to your home Wi-Fi, and uh, it connects to all your other sensors. So it needs to be put somewhere that it can actually connect to those sensors. So somewhere centrally located between all your different sensors. Um, the temperature sensor, uh, it's needs to be shaded, um, out of direct sunlight, other weather. So when you, when you doing, installing a temperature sensor, you don't want it to be directly hit by the light because then it's going to read a temperature that's too hot. You don't want it to be up against like any metal that's going to conduct heat. Um, or, you, and you don't want it to be up against like, say a wall that's going to be, uh, giving off a lot of heat as well. So. You want it shaded um, away from direct sun and then watch out for radiated heat if you're near a structure. Um, you know, at least four to five feet off the ground 
uh, with some good airflow around it, it'll give you a good um, ambient temperature reading. Um, so the wind sensor, UV sensor, rain sensor, what I did is I put it at least six feet off the ground. Uh, I'll show you on the next slide kind of the uh, official recommendations. Um, not having any obstructions nearby is important for the wind sensor and the rain sensor. Um, they need to be level. And then the uh, wind sensor, you know, in order to tell which direction the wind's blowing, needs to be facing north. And that's, you know, there's a little arrow. You make sure the arrow faces north and that's that. Uh, the other nice thing I really liked about this system that uh, made a big difference is setup time. So the hardware took me about uh, 30 minutes to put together um, because I already had a lot of it stuck together. I think if you were kind of coming at this as a novice and, and didn't have all the tools and stuff, it would take you maybe 90 minutes. So making sure you have mounting hardware and screws and you know, getting a pole and um, making sure you put everything, mount, mount everything outside after you've got it all set up on the software side. And so the software side, it took me a very short period of time. Uh, it definitely would take you much longer if you aren't familiar with uh, you know, setting up um, Wi-Fi devices. So I'd allot yourself, say, maybe two hours. Uh, I, I have a lot of slides in this presentation I'm going to skip over that really go into detail on how to set up the software. It's all in the in the user manual they provide you, but I added some you know bonus color and uh, insights and you know their Chinese manual is not the best at uh, giving great details on all the steps. So I added some more color to the uh, discussion. Um, the other big thing is you know you also want to figure out where you're going to stream your data to. So uh, I I'm streaming out to Weather Underground and Weather Cloud. These are two different weather services. Weather Underground is like probably one of the oldest online weather services. Um, I've been doing that for five or six years. Weather Cloud is a newer one. And so that one is new and it looks sleek, but it has some really cool graphs. So I like that. And so that's why I'm, I'm streaming my data there too. Um, and so all this stuff is, is kind of in the manual. I'm gonna gloss over this. All of this is gonna be available in a PDF after the presentation. So you guys can go back and Kind of review all the details if you want to, you know, follow this and set this up yourself, or if you're going to make in a different system, you know, maybe this isn't so relevant. Um, so hardware, where you're going to put up, put your system. So best practices. Um, my house is a, a neighborhood backyard, and I have a lot of trees. I have a forest across the street, and my neighbor has like a 60 foot eucalyptus tree, and I've got giant pine trees and oak trees. I can't meet the best practices. Um, I can meet the best practices for the temperature sensor because that's supposed to be about five to six feet off the ground. I can I can do that, um, but the wind is not going to happen. So it's supposed to be best practice is thirty three feet above the ground and ten times away, ten times the height away from any nearby obstructions. So that's not going to happen either because there's a sixty foot eucalyptus tree and my backyard's only 50 feet wide and it's right next to the, the edge. There's no way I could possibly do that. Um, so that's not going to happen. So, so mine mounted about six feet up. So there's some, some drawbacks to that. Uh, the rain gauge is supposed to be mounted four to six feet up uh, above the ground and at least four times the height of any nearby obstruction. So I have a, let's say 20, 30 foot pine tree in my backyard. I can't get four times that distance away from it. Um, so, you know, drawbacks. I maybe don't get accurate uh, rain readings. I guess the best practice would be just to keep it as far away from trees as you can. Um, so so I'm, my mistakes, I'll say, are that, you know, li large pine trees about 10 feet away from the installation. Uh, my wind sensor is only at six feet, it's too low. Um, after I installed all this a few months ago, I put in a, a heat wall. So uh, I'll jump back to that picture. Uh, here over on the left, I added a, um, some greenhouse insulating material uh, because I was tired of too much wind. That was a, my insight was that I get a lot of wind in my backyard. The response I had to that was, hey, I should build a wall so I don't have so much wind and I get even more heat. So that was uh, kind of my, um, 
weather sensor, uh, weather station learning that I then put back and then probably messed up its, its wind readings by putting it there. Um, so, you know, as a result of like where I decided to place everything, you know, I'm probably reading temperatures that are a little bit higher than ambient outside my yard, um, which, which I already knew and expect because I've got lots of insulating trees all around. Um, wind speeds are going to read a little lower because I got that big wall in the way now, about 10 feet off. Um, and then the rain totals might be lower if the pine tree is blocking some of that, you know, rain when it's uh, super windy, you know, so I might get less uh, rain measured. So that's, that's kind of the drawbacks. But as long as you kind of know what your limitations are of your system, you can still get um, data out of it. And, and as long as you know how to think about that data, that might be good enough for you. Um, so a whole bunch of slides now that I'm going to kind of skip over. This kind of goes into detail on all the different setup. And uh, again, I will have this as a PDF so you guys can look at it. Um, but this is kind of the, the Wi-Fi module that uh, plugs into your um, into USB and then uh, connects up to your home Wi-Fi. So lots of stuff. And then um, my station. So uh, let me switch gears a little bit and show you uh, my weather station on Weather Underground. So um, one thing I learned about Weather Underground as a whole is that it's been around a long time, but it also looks kind of clunky in comparison to some of the newer sites. Uh, I'm able to see all the basics though. So it's got um, temperature, it's got the wind, barometric pressure. Today, I guess I'm up to 1,300, seven inch, woohoo. Um, but then I, I still get all the great trends. So I could kind of go back and look at, you know, uh, how hot my, my yard got. So we actually got, it was kind of tropical today actually. Uh, so I can get all of that data going back, you know, months so i can go back and look at you know a month ago and then once you get a year's worth of data in there you can say okay well how hot did i get in the summer this this year how many chill hours did i get you know pull all that data out um so i like weather underground um one thing i also noticed about weather underground if you guys happen to use it is because my temperature in my yard tends to read higher than a lot of the other stations because I've got everything designed to be really well protected in my backyard. Um, Weather Underground doesn't actually display stations that are off by like more than 10 degrees from other stations. So they often take my station off their like map of the area because I'm reporting like so much hot, uh, hotter than everywhere else. Um, so interesting little tidbit. Uh, this is Weather Cloud. So Weather Cloud has a really snazzy um, UI and, and, and I guess cooler charts. So I like it a lot. Um, it's showing all the exact same data. It's just, it shows it with, you know, more bright, colorful charts and, you know, better ways to, to, to mix the data and look at the plots and, and pull out tables and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then uh, the company who makes all this, Ecowit. So let me pull this up. I've got my phone. So they have a phone app and this is what I use to, to there we go, there's my phone. And so this is what I use to, uh, look at my station on the go. So they have um, my outdoor temperature and then this one, the temperature and humidity channel one, that's house. Um, so my greenhouse stays a little bit warmer. It's a passive greenhouse, so it doesn't get uh, super hot. And then I've got my indoor temperature and then it's got uh, same rainfall total. So that's uh, that's the app that you can use from anywhere. I think it's available. I know it's available for Android, but uh, I'm not sure about iOS. Um, uh, 
and that's that's the gist of it. I mean, that's um, why what I do with weather and uh, and uh, why I think you guys could do weather stations too. I think everyone should have one. Anyone have any questions? Uh, does weather underground calculate chill hours? I uh, don't know that one okay. off the top of my head. I was wondering, since since you can't put the uh, various sensors high enough off the ground, in a way, you're really getting the readings from your own yard and your own personal conditions. It's more accurate for you. It's just it's not going to map onto the general weather in the area, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm doing it for me. I'm not doing it for like, you know, all the, the neighborhood per se. So I think it, I mean, it, it's telling me how my yard's doing and that's that's really what I want to know. So the rest of us might just go ahead and put it, put our sensors in our backyards in, you know, lower down. So we're actually getting the conditions that our plants are meeting rather than try to go professional and measure wind speed 30 feet in the air that's true yeah i mean we you want you want to see the conditions your plants are getting not necessarily you know you're not forecasting the weather or anything so maybe that's that's right yeah okay cool does uh do any of these apps jason show you uh relative comparisons between your station versus the others around you you well so on i know on weather underground you can certainly view the uh, map of all the stations around you i haven't done any i haven't tried to do any comparisons between any nearby stations to see um unsure okay olivia asked uh, can you view the weather stations there in your area before your own weather station is up and running and yeah yeah so let's take a look at weather underground i think if i Click on, let's see, their, their wonder map. They have, they should have all the all the weather stations up for the area. Um, maybe, maybe this is not weather stations. Here we go. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Let's see, maps. Where are them? Where are they all? Yeah, there's there's like about a dozen in Pacific Grove, um, between all the different places. Yeah, so mine is is the this uh, sixty six degrees, and there's you know, right now because we're not uh, there's no sun and things. Mine's reading about the same as everyone else's, so we're all about sixty six. Does it similarly show rainfall at the different stations? Oh, I see. There is a precipitation. Yeah, looks like it. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you can yeah. you can do some kind of visual comparison. I don't know that there's a you know um, more rigorous comparison that you can automatically do, but I think you can download the data. And if you want to pump it into Excel, uh, you could do that. Um, does the equipment measure air quality? I really like purple air and haven't connected my system to purple air because I didn't get the particle sensor, but that's one of the add-on sensors you can get is the particulate matter sensor. Um, I was looking at purple air like pretty much every single day during the wildfires in 2020 because I wanted to know whether or not it was safe to breathe outside. So um, there definitely weren't enough stations in my area that had uh the particulate matter stuff so yeah adding those on if it's cheap enough i haven't looked at the cost you know would be a nice thing to have yeah awesome jason. oh yes no, go ahead oh yeah well jason i was wondering about the, the rainfall measure it seems like none of those meters are working down in pacific grove We've had like seven tenths of an inch up here. It looks like you're all like one point point one three. Uh, we just didn't get much. Well, I, I I don't know if this is cumulative or in the last hour or whatever. We didn't get much rain. Oh, geez. Yeah, um, yeah, I know. Well, I you had me totally sold in the first like 
a minute and a half. I wanted to sign up, but then you said the thing is to be connected to Wi-Fi mm -hmm. constantly. What happens uh, so that that eliminates the possibility for putting one out in my orchard on the on the orchard floor? So not not really. Uh, so if you get a solar cell and a battery and a Wi-Fi hotspot, say from you know Verizon, T-Mobile, etc. Uh -huh. It's about 20 bucks a month um, and keep that thing powered. Uh, you can set it up there. 20 bucks a month. So well, yeah, again, there's, there's that cost. So it depends how much you want that data. Yeah. Okay. Or if you can like, you know, hijack some of the neighbor's Wi-Fi there. <laughs> <laughs> it's out in the sticks. I don't even know if the neighbors can, you know, have Wi-Fi. It's, it's pretty bad. Um, yeah, I mean, how about I, my house? I do know if you have Google Fi, um, you can get uh, data only sims for free on your plan uh, because I exploited this a lot for, for a different project and uh, and it costs you nothing per month to run run the uh, mobile hotspots. Oh, wow. Okay. That's interesting. So it all depends on the service you have. He has no idea what you're talking about, Jason, <laughs> when you talk about mobile hotspots. <laughs> you're wasting your breath. <laughs> So Jason, what's the, typical, look it up what's the typical range? Like, okay, we know it works in your backyard, which is a, you know, regular mm -hmm. neighborhood backyard size thing. But, you know, what would be the further range? Is it all just dependent on your Wi-Fi out to the sensors? No, so the, the Wi-Fi to the, like, there's, so there's like the, the, the main weather station hub, I'll say, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the unit that goes in your house. Mm -hmm. That's actually con transmitting via uh, a different band out to the weather sensor. So it's, it's like an ISM band. Um, so that transmits quite a bit further. Um, I think it's like 700 megahertz or something like that. Um, and so you get a bit more range. I don't know. It definitely goes anywhere in my yard, but I don't know how far it can go because I haven't played around with it. Okay. So I'll say 100 feet at least. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Jason? Well, Jason, that was great. Thank you so much. Very interesting. I, I, I'm sure a lot of us appreciate the idea of a weather station that's uh, modular. I, I did not know such existed. And I, I think this is great. And I look forward to getting a PDF with all the information. Uh, so if everyone's uh, good, we're going to move on to our second half of our program tonight. And I think, you know, with the lovely rain that many of us had today, apparently, except for Jason, um, uh, this is really good timing because it kind of makes the ground a little easier to work with. And so Sharon Zoe is uh, going to talk to us a little bit about her experience with soil preparation with an eye towards, you know, what's going on in your garden that you need to amend, what do you need to do to get ready for planting trees uh, in the coming season? So with that, Sharon, give me a second. I'm gonna make you a co-host. All right, Sharon, take it away. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so, soil prep. Um, I'm going to go through a few things that are really important. Uh, I prepared four pages of material, but I'm not going to just sit here and read that all to you. Um, so hopefully, if you want to plan, say next January, February, hopefully you've selected a site. But if you haven't, there are a few things to consider uh, in your site selection. So number one is sunlight. Um, how many hours? Um, that's really crucial for, for, uh, for fruit trees because uh, fruits are result of photosynthesis, well, indirectly. And the sunlight requirement also uh, depends on the species and the variety. And then the other aspect uh, to consider for site is um, the slope and the, the orientation 
and if there's any wind blocks or uh, forest that, that shades, uh, these can all affect uh, the microclimate, like Jason's backyard. Um, so the couple of really important things um, to consider before you start prepping the soil is number one is how good is your drainage? Um, you could do a really easy percolation test. Uh, what that involves is you dig a big hole, not, not that big, one foot deep hole, one foot across. Um, and um, you fill that hole with water all the way to the rim. And then you let it drain slowly. And you take, um, you take the reading on how long it takes for the water to completely drain. Um, if it drains faster than one hour, um, your soil is too porous. It's not gonna be able to um, hold too much moisture. And that's a problem, especially um, with our drought. If it takes more than three hours for the, the water to completely drain, then uh, the drainage is considered poor. And um, it may be, the soil may be too compacted or uh, too much clay. So the solution is to increase the organic matter. And uh, oh, by the way, if you, the water drains too quickly, the solution is also to increase the, the organic matter. And if the drain time is between one and three hours, then um, it'll be fine for, uh, for you to plant at that location, at least drainage wise. Uh, but it never hurts to increase organic matter content. Um, the next important thing is to get a soil test. Um, we have used uh, A&L Western Labs in Modesto. Uh, five years ago when we did that, it costed us $35. Um, I don't know what it costs now. Um, it, I don't think it's a whole lot more than that. So the soil test um, will also help you to determine your, if your site is appropriate for, your, uh, for the plants you want to plant. Um, so the test will tell you things like uh, the pH, the salinity of your soil, conductivity, um, which equates with how well um, the soil nutrients could be easily accessed by your plant. Um, it also tells you the available macro and micronutrient level. And uh, in the case of ANL Western Lab, they also uh, tell you how to improve the shortcomings. So when you send in the test, they'll ask you, uh, what do you want to plant? And whether you're using organic, organic or conventional method. And uh, so based on all of that, they will make recommendations as to how much of what um, to add to your soil to, to, to improve it. Um, oftentimes it's about the deficient nutrient, um, but sometimes some things are just too much. And by the way, um, if the soil has too much of something, um, you know, some mineral elements are toxic, um, but oftentimes with high organic matter, um, it'll help to offset a lot of different shortcomings. Okay. So preparing the soil. So what's, what's in the soil? What's the soil makeup? Um, most soil comprises about 45% minerals by volume, 25% uh, uh, roughly 25% air and 25% water and uh, about three to 5% of organic matter. The uh, space, the amount of, uh, well, the volume that air and water takes kind of seesaws. Uh, when one is high, the other one is low because uh, this is the result of, you know, your irrigation, the wet and dry cycle, and of course also the weather. Um, so when do you want to do soil preparation? Ideally, you want to do it um, 
several months before you want to plant. Um, and if the soil is in really bad shape, you might want to start preparing the soil a year or two in advance. Um, and fall and winter um, are ideal seasons to uh, start working on improving your soil because um, it, it's a great time to boost organic matter because most organic matter boosting practices require water to work. So hopefully uh, nature will provide. <laughs> So why do you want to improve the soil? Um, you want the best chance. Well, so before planting is your best one chance to improve the soil uh, for, for the very long life of your fruit tree. Um, especially with uh, plants that are sensitive to root disturbance like avocados or citrus. Um, you don't want to be digging around it once the plant uh, settles in. Um, deciduous fruits are a little less sensitive about that. Um, basically planting in good soil um, allows your plant to uh, grow very vigorously uh, for the first few years and setting up a good structure and foundation for um, the good, fr good fruit it's going to bear. So how do you do it? Um, so, so I, I have with, uh, some of this, uh, these techniques myself for a while, um, about five years um, in Santa Cruz in primarily sandy loam soil. Uh, we just moved to Berkeley and now we have um, clay soil. So what I have to deal with is a totally new game. Uh, fortunately, the one thing that works for everything is improving organic matter. Um, so if you have extremely, uh, if you have soil that's extremely um, devoid of organic matter or uh, microbial life um, or severely compacted, uh, one round of judicious digging or tilling uh, will probably be really helpful uh, to mixing uh, a good amount of compost. Um, the, the goal is to not keep digging, the goal is to, uh, to go no-till in the orchard, um, but this mixing in the compost is a faster way um, to get more pore space. Remember, pore space is needed for, uh, for water and air uh, to, to introduce organic matter and also to inoculate the soil with the uh, microbes that will help with uh, both the delivery of nutrients and the holding of soil, uh, holding of soil moisture. Um, so you do... And, and after you do the till, if you have really bad soil, um, then you proceed with um, one or multiple of three practices, um, cover cropping, uh, mulching, or sheet mulching, which is a kind of mulching. So I'm going to talk um, first about cover cropping because that's, um, an area I've had a lot of experience of. Um, I learned a lot of what I talk about here are material that I learned um, from um, UCSC, Center for Agroecology, uh, and the farm in Allen Chatwood Garden. And I have also um, played around with these techniques at home for the last several years. Um, sometimes with success and other times with failure. So I'm going to share some of these. Okay, so cover cropping is what I've done the most of. Um, it's not that I have so much patience to take a year to, to plant cover crop before I want to plant the tree. Um, it's more like I'm indecisive. I can't decide what I want to put where. So in the meantime, 
I might as well plant cover crop uh, because I think of cover crop as um, temporary. So once I make up my mind, I wouldn't mind ripping out the cover crop to put in the tree that I want to plant there. <laughs> so, um, so I'll get to what kind of plants to use for cover crop in a little while. So uh, generally, it's best sown uh, right before a heavy rain event, like um, Thursday or Friday of this past week would have been perfect time <laughs> to sow cover crop seeds. Um, it, the rain caught us by surprise a little bit, but we did run out and, and threw some um, buckwheat seeds out there. Uh, so once you sow, you can sow at the recommended amount per acre, uh, but you could also sow extremely um, densely. It'll just produce more organic matter. Um, and then you want to cover that with three to five inches of mulch. The mulch could be either wood chips or um, leaves or uh, straw. Um, we've had good luck getting a lot of wood chips. So um, wood chips tends to like stay put better and last um, a little longer and the wind doesn't blow it away. So, so then you let it grow through the winter season. So if you want to plant in late January, uh, uh, a couple of weeks before you plan to do the planting, you want to take down your cover crop. Um, so you could either mow the cover crop or I usually cut it by hand with the seckle. Um, and once it's cut, you lay it on the ground, you just chop it with a little bit with a sharp spade um, or a machete. Um, it doesn't have to be chopped fine. You just need to kind of break the cuticle surface of the plant material. So uh, bacteria and other organisms could get into the plant material more easily to start breaking it down. Um, then again, I would cover with another three to five inches of uh, wood chips. Uh, if you have plenty of wood chips available, just go ahead and lay another layer. Uh, whereas if I didn't have additional wood chips available or just small amount, what I would do is, is rake the wood chips out of the way set all the green stuff down and then cover everything with three to five inches of wood chip. So I don't want to see the green anymore. Everything should be completely covered. And then at that point, um, you, could, uh, you could water. Water it in. Uh, another thing some people do, like people do it on the farm is to use a, a big cover of a uh, plastic called silage cover. Uh, that speeds up, that just keeps things warmer and wetter inside, that speeds up the decomposition. Um, if you take the um, cover crop down when they're young enough at a tender enough stage, which I strongly recommend for a home gardener, um, in the case of uh, bell beans, which is what I use the most frequent, frequently, um, within like two or three weeks, if I pull up the wood chips, um, I can't really recognize the bell bean plant parts anymore. So at that point, it's kind of broken down enough um, to go ahead and plant. So I would pull all of this mulch material um, with a rake off to the side and then dig a hole. And once you dig the hole, you could decide, you could assess the soil and you might want to run a percolation test again and see um, how the drainage is. Um, if things are, if the soil is looking fluffy enough, uh, this would be in, in January, February, in the spring, or um, a little later uh, for planting citrus and avocado. Um, so if the soil looks fine, you could go ahead and plant. Um, if the drainage is snow has improved, but not quite there yet, uh, or if the soil is still tight, but somewhat improved, um, 
you could use this uh, multi-year hole method that I'll talk about later. Um, so that's the cover cropping. I will talk about cover crop uh, variety in, in a little while. So the second method um, I just learned from um, Ken at Bobcat Ridge uh, Avocado Farm, where we visited a couple of weeks ago. Um, so how he prepares his clay soil in a uh, previously unplanted area is um, he will pile four to six inches of uh, horse manure. And then uh, Brock has gypsum or rock dust. Um, I think both of those are optional, but, but uh, they are helpful in some situations. And then he will pile a lot more wood chips on top and just let it sit for a month until spring. Uh, this is what Ken uh, recommended for me um, to work with my uh, uh, very heavy clay soil here. So in the spring, you turn all of this material in. Um, you raise them, he raises them into either a mound or a, a berm, and he would be planting um, the avocado trees on a mound or on, on a berm. Um, so rock dust uh, is, like I said, is optional, but it does help to provide long-term um, nutrients, especially micronutrients. And gypsum helps to loosen clay soil and prevents uh, root rot uh, for avocados and I think also prevents um, bitter pit for apples. So there's uh, mulching. This with horse manure. This method I haven't tried yet, but I am going to. And somebody even offered me some horse manure. So the third method is sheet mulching, which involves cardboard, compost, and wood chips. Um, there is a lot of that information online. Um, and we will be using this to take down a lawn. But I'm not going to go into the details because there is a lot of information online that you could uh, you could find. Even uh, Water District um, provide that information also because they want everybody to take down their lawn. Okay, so I'll talk about the multi-year hole method. So what if? What if I have not prepared my soil and my soil is really bad, like heavily, um, heavily compacted clay and no um, microbial activity at all. And it's been fallow for years. Um, but I already bought my bare tree root, uh, bare root, bare root tree. And uh, I need to plant right now. I'm not going to wait. So what do I do? <clears throat> if you can't wait, which I still recommend that you do wait. <clears throat> so what you want to do is um, you want to dig a hole that's large enough uh, to, accommodate, to accommodate this tree's root system for the next one to two years. Um, the first time we planted our three apple trees, um, we planted three in a very large hole uh, and we hadn't prepared the soil ahead of time. So uh, we did this method, I think Mark dug a hole that was like about 10 feet in diameter. And then we mixed in um, up to 25% compost, um, except back then we didn't know any better. We went to the garden center and bought the bags of this, um, I think what they call planting mix. Um, I Today, knowing what I know, I would definitely use compost. Um, <clears throat> so you want to allow about one foot of uh, root extension per year. Um, so Mark just kind of went overboard and dug a 10 foot <laughs> white hole. And uh, I also recommend um, whenever possible, especially if you're digging a smaller hole, to dig a square hole instead of a round hole because uh, 
round hole is more likely to cause um, the root to circle. And then given enough time, the circling will cause girdling, which can eventually um, kill the tree. Whereas uh, square sides, when the root runs up against um, you know, the edge of the hole, it's less likely to just turn around and keep wrapping around. It's more likely to force itself into the soil. And you also want to fracture uh, the bottom of the hole and uh, the walls of the hole. That just means uh, you take a fork and you push into it so, so the surface is not just smooth and the transition from the dug soil to the hard soil, um, hard pan. You just want to make that irregular. Uh, that'll help um, roots to go through. And um, so you plant a tree, you backfill with the native soil mixed in with, um, again, up to 25% compost. So this compost will help to provide pore space in, in your, say, very bad, very tight soil. Um, and inoculate the whole, um, the backfill soil with microbes. And um, so, and also to provide some, uh, some nutrients. Um, and as soon as you, you finish planting, after you water in, of course, after any planting, the first thing you do is watering the soil in so it, it settles. So as soon as you finish planting, start doing uh, one of these th uh, three practices I mentioned earlier, whether it's cover cropping or um, you know, mulching with manure or uh, sheet, mulching, sheet mulching, especially if you're dealing with weed situation. So starting at the edge of your hole and you want to expand this, these practices um, towards the unamended soil. So, the purpose of um, doing that is to improve that soil, that un amended soil uh, for a year or two ahead of when your new tree's root system reaches it. So uh, by the time the root system takes up the space in the, in the hole, um, the unamended soil will be nice and fluffy and uh, rich in nutrients and easy for it to, uh, to penetrate. So that's the story on, um, on the multi-year hole. <laughs> okay, so how am I doing on time? All right. Yeah, you're, you're doing fine, okay. Sharon. It's about eight o'clock. Okay. So, you know, I think okay. we could go for a little longer and then take some questions. Um, okay. I, okay. I think we're doing good. So I'll talk about what kind of cover crop um, to plant. So a lot of this is based on my experience of what's easy to do uh, in the home setting. Um, so in terms of increasing organic matter content, um, there are definitely mixes that can produce a lot more but they, also, they are also so much harder to work with. Um, say if you have grasses that grows to be five, six feet tall, um, and especially if it's in your front yard, your neighbors are not gonna appreciate that very much. Um, so two of my favorite um, cover crops, um, number one during the summer is I use buckwheat. Uh, that's just super, super, super easy to work with and to take down. Um, so it produces a lot of organic matter and in the forms of the very fine roots that leaves in the soil. It doesn't penetrate terribly deeply. I would say probably about eight inches, 10 inches is, is what I found in the research. Um, it has a very short life cycle, about six to eight weeks. So you can do several cycles of it during the warm season. And it's the multiple cycle that you do that allows you to, to add a lot of organic matter. Um, so the first time you broadcast it and you could throw some wood chips over it to help it to maintain, uh, hold on to moisture. Um, 
you water it in, it does take water to get going, but um, once it gets going, it doesn't take that much water to maintain. And as it comes to, into bloom, uh, by the way, the bloom is really, really attract, uh, attractive to pollinators as well as beneficial insects. Um, the kind of insects that prey on um, pests like aphids. Um, so to do the second cycle, before you even pull the plants up, you broadcast the seed again. You know, this is like eight weeks after your first planting. You broadcast the seed again, just among the standing plants. They might be 12 inches tall, 15 inches tall. Uh, and they're all really upright. Once you got the seeds down, then you pull the plants up. You could just really, really easily pull it. And most of the roots will break off and stay in the soil. You might get like two or three inches. You could just lay the pulled up plants over the seeds as a mulch. Um, you could put down more wood chips if you want to, um, not necessary. Um, you water in again. So um, I love this because it's just super, super easy. I don't really need to chop it. Um, and it attracts so many pollinators. Um, we love bees and it's really wonderful to watch uh, how enthusiastic bees visit the, the buckwheat patch. So that's during the summer. Um, during the fall and winter, um, you could use either bell beans or fava beans. They're basically the same plant. Uh, bell beans are, just have smaller beans. So as a result, the seed is a lot cheaper to buy. You get a lot more plants and a lot uh, more organic matter out of the, um, the cost of the seeds. So bell beans or fava beans uh, fix nitrogen really well. And, um, Clovers fix nitrogen also, uh, but one of the beauty of bell beans or fava beans is that in California soil, you don't need to inoculate them with rhizobium. Whereas if you're planting clover for the first time, you need to inoculate with, uh, them with rhizobium. And rhizobium is the um, bacteria that uh, is synergistic with the legume plant they make these nodules on the root and these nodules fix nitrogen. Um, okay, so, so a side note. So when you're growing legume um, as a cover crop, the way to check if it's actually fixing nitrogen for you or not is to pull up um, one or two plants and look at the uh, root nodules and squish the nodule with your fingernails. Um, a nodule that's actually fixing nitrogen should look um, pink on the outside, but as you squish it in, it's almost wine colored on the inside. Um, if the nodules are white inside and outside, then uh, these plants haven't gotten the uh, synergistic bacteria they need in order to fix nitrogen. So you'll need to uh, inoculate. But uh, my experience is that um, I don't need to inoculate and the, the nodules are showing me that uh, they're fixing nitrogen. They're usually nice pink or even purple color. Um, so, Another benefit of legumes is that um, it has a really strong tap root. So uh, it kind of can drill into tight soil. So with bell beans, it's easiest to incorporate um, if you take it down before it flowers or at just the early phase of flowering. Uh, if you let it go longer, you'll get more organic matter. But um, at home, I prefer for it to be easier because if it gets hard, then I procrastinate and it gets worse and worse. Uh, as a plant get really woody, it's nearly impossible to chop down 
uh, without using machines. Like we didn't even have a lawnmower. So everything was done by hand. Um, you could either cut it, I use, I use a seckle to cut it at the soil, uh, soil level, or uh, I use a spade. Um, I sharpen the leading edge of the spade and just push the spade horizontally uh, along the soil line. And that'll cut the plant off, leaving the roots um, in the soil. And uh, that jostling that comes with cutting the top down will break uh, the nodules loose and then the nitrogen will get released into the soil. So you roughly chop with the spade or machete again, uh, lay it on the soil and you top um, that green stuff with three to five inches of uh, wood chips. Uh, you water. So basically what you're doing is you have the green material of the uh, cover crop you took down and then you have the brown of the wood chips. So basically you're making compost in place. You don't need to turn it, you don't need to haul it to somewhere else. Um, so you water it well and um, and then again if you take it down early enough um, after two or three weeks, the bell beans won't be uh, recognizable as the, their original plant parts anymore. So at that point, um, you could plant. Um, okay, so another cover crop worth considering is mustard. Um, one of the beauty of mustard seeds is um, Birds don't like to eat them. So if you have problem with birds, especially in the fall, uh, eating the seeds that you sow, um, you might just want to mix your uh, whatever it is that you sow for cover cropping with some mustard. Because that way, if the birds eat your seeds, uh, at least you have some mustard to fall back on. Um, so one thing with mustard is be sure you cut it down before it sets seeds because some varieties could be really, really invasive once uh, they're allowed to set to, uh, to self seeds. And these seeds could stay viable in the soil and not germinate for years. Um, the other thing to know is that mustard flowers are extremely attractive to pollinators. So, um, you don't want mustard to be competing for pollinators with your fruit trees. So be sure you chop down the mustard um, before your trees flower. Okay, I think that's all the material I have prepared. Um, sorry, I don't have much experience making presentations. <laughs> So um, why don't we uh, take a second oh, and show your documents real quick? Because I think that those were oh, yes, and yes, helpful yes, yes. too. I forgot right? about that. No worries. Yeah. Let's uh, share my screen. We're going to take a look at the uh, soil document first. So everybody, um, Sharon sent me the documents to share. And here we are with a sample of a soil test report. And Sharon, do you want to talk about this just briefly? Sure. Um, this, this was um, a soil test we did about five years ago before we started planting um, our fruit trees in Santa Cruz. Um, on top, I guess I can't use, uh, oh, I don't know if I could use my pointer. I um, guess not. So No, because I've got it. I've got top. control of it. Yeah, so. Okay, so that horizontal graph with colors. It shows you different, um, different mineral elements and how much you have. So the blue color, if it's in the blue zone, it's low. The green zone is medium and just right. The red um, is very high. Some cases like calcium, when it's very high, it doesn't really hurt anything. But if you have too much things like boron, uh, that could create some toxicity for the soil. And uh, below that horizontal graph, um, 
There's ECE 0 0.5, and um, that is, okay, that shows how, how, how much salinity in the soil. So in this case, our soil is in the low region, so that, that makes it good for salt-sensitive plants. And the next one is uh, CEC, I think that's cation exchange, um, I forgot what the next C stands for. Uh, basically, it, what that number represents is how conductive your soil is. And the, the more conductive it is, the easier it is for the plant to absorb the available nutrients. Um, X lime, I don't know what that is. It's high. So um, further to the right, you see 7.8. That shows the soil pH. And uh, I think this is pretty typical of uh, the coastal terraces. Uh, there's just a lot of um, uh, calcium carbonate from, uh, from shells in the soil. And um, so under soil fertility guidelines, you'll see crop colon apple, because we told them uh, we're going to be growing apple. And, um, and the green, the line of green um, elements is, um, is the macro or uh, micronutrients that they recommend that we amend the soil with. So in this case, uh, they recommend that we do um, 25, I don't know, it's parts, pounds, i sorry. Um, and amend with nitrogen because the soil is low in nitrogen, uh, a little bit of phosphorus, um, potash, so uh, potassium is also quite low. And so under comments, you could see that uh, it says high level organic um, matter should have a beneficial e effect. Um, and pH may not be as much of an issue when you have high organic matter. And then it goes on to uh, recommend what kind of uh, amendments, how much and when to apply. Um, and then the next page, um, let's see. Getting there, yep. Go to page two, yeah, yeah. The, so the first page was the front yard where we're planting our orchard and the back yard is much shadier. So we're gonna plant some camellia, which is a shade loving plant. So um, it recommends um, more sulfur, uh, to bring down the pH uh, for uh, acid loving plant. So that's like an example of the graphical soil analysis and, and their recommendation. Okay, how about the next slide? Here we go. <laughs> Can you see it? Oh. Not yet. Okay, just a sec. There we go. Now you should see it, I think. Here we go. So I'm just sharing a couple of really useful links. Um, I learned most of what I know from Alan Chatwood Garden. And um, you could find a much more detailed video on preparing for winter planning, uh, including selecting site and uh, um, soil testing and a lot more information about soil um, on the um, in this video. It's almost two hours long. It's it's a recorded workshop called "Getting Started with Fruit Trees," um, made by Warren Martin. And um, you can also find additional um, educational videos on uh, all aspects of organic farming. Um, at the UCSC Center for Agroecology website. So I included the link there. And um, 
there's the end of my presentation. Well, thank you, Sharon. Well done. And um, folks, you. you don't need to worry about trying to figure out what these links are. I will send them out um, along with Jason's presentation when I send out the link for the video recording. So you'll have everything all in one spot. Um, so let me uh, stop sharing my screen. And now I think what we'd like to do is open things up to everyone. Uh, I know that we all have our preferred ways of, um, you know, doing uh, our soil prep. Uh, some of us don't do it at all, shame on us. Others have our own little tricks and techniques. And um, it would be great to kind of do a little round robin and, you know, see what people tend to think. I do, before we jump to that, um, want to mention, because I see there's a little chat going on about uh, horse manure and whether or not the salt in horse manure uh, is harmful. And I, I didn't know. So I did a quick look on Google and it says that it actually has less salt than most other manures. Um, that might be a good place for us to start. Does anybody else have information about salt in horse manure or deworming medications lingering as residues in horse manure that would make horse manure less desirable to use. Go ahead and unmute yourself and, and jump in if you have a response. I had access <clears throat> to horse manure and um, made three, two big compost piles using horse manure alternating with orange rinds um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, I was preparing two places to plant avocados. And what I found really interesting was at the end of, of the maturing phase of this um, compost, the, the orange rinds, which I had not chopped up, they were almost halves, um, had all disappeared and, and the little horse nuggets were still there. It was really a surprise to me. I did not add a lot of water um, and I can still find this little dry little horse straw bits out there. So, anyway, and my, those horses um, were not getting dewormer because they, uh, they were on sand. So in that case, but, but previously I picked up horse manure um, for my East Bay property and put it in one raised bed and that bed became fallow. And that's when I discovered that information about the dewormers. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Uh, anyone else using horse manure in their orchards? Or their compost um, pots? So I try to grow biodynamic. And we're, what I learned is that you try to just be careful of the horse manure that you get because the horses in our area do tend to be heavily medicated with your wormer. I mean, it's the most heavily medicated animal as, mm. as I was taught. It may not be the case if you're somewhere else, you know, not in California, maybe like in a more rural area, then those horses are probably, that horse manure is probably more desirable. But I tend to stay away from the horse manure around here just because they're really, they get a lot of uh, medication. But that's just me, other people may be okay with it. I will say that we've been layering, alternating um, horse manure and then wood chips on top of that. And it seems to take about a year for things to decompose. Um, and this is in our orchard. So we're, you know, making like a donut around the tree and, uh, and then they get watered. And it seems to, it seems to me that the trees are remarkably happy with the situation. I mean, not every tree, right? But most of them seem to be happy and growing well. So I've been pretty pleased with that. I would also add, I, I don't see Ken on the uh, program tonight, but we visited his farm as I think Olivia had mentioned a couple of weeks. Oh no, sorry, it was Sharon who mentioned that a couple of weeks ago uh, as a group. And boy, did he have a lot of horse manure on his farm. I mean, piles and piles of horse manure. 
Um, and uh, it was very interesting. Uh, I mean, truckloads of it, really. So, you know, he's getting good results with it as well. I mean, certainly very healthy looking trees on his property. So it's interesting though, isn't it? That we all have, you know, different experiences with using these things. So um, good luck on the horse manure situation. <laughs> Uh, who, who else? Yeah, is the dewormer thing is definitely a concern. So I'm going to have to search for, you know, a source that's, that's safe. Uh, regarding salt content, um, so I was taught that if the horse manure includes uh, horse bedding, uh, which has absorbed the horse urine, it will have a lot more salt. If it's just manure without the bedding mixing, uh, it should have lower salt content. Oh, very interesting. All right, let's see. Carol Peck is uh, commenting for us. Hi, Carol. Uh, she says, since my focus is California native plants, including trees, I don't prepare my soil, just dig a hole twice as wide as the container and as deep, then mix any loose potting soil with the soil from the hole. This gives the roots a chance to go from potting soil to a mix of soils to native soil without circling. Also uh, ensure that there is a mound for drainage if needed. Yes, I think getting the tree at the proper height is very important as well. Um, anyone else uh, following something similar to what Carol is up to? So uh, let me talk a little bit about something that I tried last year, and this was the Johnson Sioux extract. Um, very interesting stuff. So in case you weren't on the presentation that the Golden Gate chapter did, I want to say almost a year ago, um, Johnson Sioux is a method of composting that they call a bioreactor. So rather than your maybe more typical three foot by three foot by three foot compost pile, uh, this thing is uh, six feet tall and five feet wide. And you fill it up with shredded materials that you have gotten wet and you mix in uh, manure and you can put in straw, you can use leaves, et cetera, et cetera. And you let that pile uh, sit for a year to 18 months. And then the resulting uh, material, you soak in water to make an extract and you strain that out and then you can spray it uh, onto your ground, either when you're putting in your cover crops, etc. cetera. Um, and so I was lucky to get hold of some of it from the presenter, that was John Wilson, who used to be in the Bay Area, now is out in Oklahoma. And I have to say, I sprayed it when I was putting down the seed for my cover crops. And for a number of reasons, I didn't do a terrific job of covering up the seed. You know, I mean, normally you'd, you'd put something on top of it. And I was kind of just, you know, scratching in with the rake and hoping for the best because I was too time challenged to deal with it. But I was very impressed at the growth of the cover crop. And so I'm hoping to try something like that. Again, this year, I have a couple of empty spots to put in new trees thanks to a deer that came through and broke off one of my trees at the base. So not even the root stock is reusable. I mean, just like broke it like it was angry, trampled the fencing, ate all the leaves. I mean, it's like it was passionate about it. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to, you know, put a couple things in there and I'm going to try the, um, try some of our own compost, some of the Johnson Sioux extract, and then put in some cover crop. And even though the cover crop won't be there for long, um, 
you know, kind of hope for the best with that. Um, let's see, Alice is asking, uh, where do we all like to get cover crop seeds? Um, if you're in the San, Santa Cruz area, you can get them at General Feed. Um, oh, I'm in South Bay in the Sunnyvale. Oh, okay. Um, you can order them from Pleasant Valley. Is that the right name, folks? Somebody help me out here. Um, bum, bum, bum. Peaceful, Peaceful Valley. Valley. Peaceful Valley. Um, oh, but Peaceful. yeah, depending on how much you want, obviously seed in quantity is kind of heavy. Um, no, I have a small space. I don't need a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have bought mine from a uh, Harmony Farm Supply and they're in Petaluma, and, um, Santa Rosa, but they sell it in bulk. So I have bought like three ounces of something to try, but it is a little farther away from you, but it's an incredible store. Um, and their selection of fruit tree during the berry root season is also incredible. So it's, it's kind of worth a trip there. Their prices are really reasonable and they also have buckwheat. For some reason, buckwheat is not showing on their website because you could order from their website. Uh, you might need to call them um, to to get get an order of a buckwheat if if you're looking for that. But most of the cover crop seeds are organic, and the selection is huge. What place is that, Sharon? Huh? What is that place you're talking about? A uh, Harmony Farm Supply. Oh, there on one six. Almost in Forestville. It's a fun trip to make if you get to go up to the Redwood Empire Science Exchange because you're in Santa Rosa already. And then go on out to Harmony Farm Supply and pick up some bare root trees and all. And yeah, make a make a trip of it. Not that I've done that from Marina, but I used to do it from El Sobrante. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Every year when I've gone after the Redwood Empire ch chapter of uh, Sion Exchange, I've, I've seen lots of other CRFG folks there. Um, and we're also getting a suggestion of uh, San Lorenzo in Santa Cruz, another good place. Not much help for um, folks up in the Sunnyvale uh, area, however. Yeah, I, I also have a separate question. I just ordered, I just received uh, three citrus trees and one passion fruit tree uh, for planting. And they, and I, it took me a long time to find the right location, but I haven't had a chance to prepare my soil. And I was wondering, because we just had rain, if I should just put them down into the ground or I should just put them, transfer them into a five gallon pot and wait maybe until, like do the prep soil thing now and wait until maybe February to plant into the ground. Um, yeah, I just maybe get your thoughts on that. Uh, the, my my soil is clay soil, but in, they are not super bad. They are they're, they have reasonable drainage. Okay, so my concern is that um, citrus does not like root disturbance. So if you transplant, if you up pot it into a five gallon pot, by the time you're ready to plant, it may have may may not have taken up all the soil, all the new soil you put in. So when you pull the plant up, some of the soil may fall off, okay? Which then can cause much more distress to, to the root than if the whole thing, you know, just come off with the soil in place. Uh, you might be able to, you might want to try the, you know, the, the, the multi-year hole method. So go ahead and plant it, but, but just start doing, um, doing cover cropping and, and mulching to improve that soil there. And if you have concerns about drainage, you might just want to plant it a little bit higher. Anybody yeah, sounds good. 
that would be a plan. So Just Alice, plant what, it what now. Size, what, size about pot, what size pot? What size pot are they in currently? They are in that. I don't know if you bought like avocado before. Like they're they're in the tall, uh, square shaped. Yeah. Rectangular. Yeah, it, it's in a tree pot. Yeah, yeah, it's in okay. a tree pot. Yeah. Okay. A tree pot. Okay. I don't know what it's called, but they—that's where they are sitting. Uh, they, they've been at my house for two days now, and I—I I saw the. I was happy to see the rain, so I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should just put them into the ground since the soil is wet now. With avocado, I'm a little reluctant, but I'm also kind of reluctant to keep it in the tree pot for until next spring. Oh no no the uh, not avocado it's passion fruit and uh, three citrus sumo valencia and golden uh, gold nugget Where did you buy sumo I want to know <laughs> Tomorrow harvest Tomorrow? It's a it's a play okay. it's a website in southern california but I was I'm really interested to buy kishu but they ran out of kishu Okay I can't find Kishu anywhere. <laughs> it looks like Marianne has sent us a uh, suggestion for getting the cover crops from Sam's downtown feed and pet supply. Marianne, what town is that in, please? It's in San Jose on West San Carlos Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. So that's another option for our folks in the South Bay. That's great. Yeah, and they, they definitely uh, carry uh, fava beans, I know. Super. Or they have in the past, at least, yes. Let's see. So we have a question about permaculture. Uh, uh, let me just respond to Deidre's question about what place in San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo is actually a nursery supply in Santa Cruz. Not in San Lorenzo itself. Hope that helps. Okay, great. Um, and then Lulu is asking about uh, if anyone is into permaculture. She has some trees planted on a berm and was told that trees planted on a berm are so high they cannot take advantage of the water table. Has anyone been given the same information? So Ken talked about that when we were at his farm. Um, he used to plant them on the, on the mound. Now he has, um, he plants on the berm because immediately next to the berm is the depression. So, I, I thought the idea is that the depression will gather water and right. uh, sink that water so the water doesn't just run off. But I haven't tried it myself. Right. So, yeah, his place looked um, very interesting because you'd have a tree up high and then like a ditch and then another sloped up section with a tree on it and then another ditch. It was a little scary to walk in, actually. <laughs> um, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. And the berms and the depression are all like pretty much level, except for like about a 1% slope, he said. I, mm -hmm. Isn't that what they call key line in permaculture? I don't know. <laughs> but let and me tell you, I have a neighbor and her trees are not, fruit trees are not on a berm, you know, just plant it regular. And she doesn't water them ever. She says, oh, she says it's because that's just what we do in permaculture. She says, you know, we have a really high water table. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, what have I done? Because <sighs> my trees are on a berm and I have to water them like crazy. And she says, no, I never. She says, I never water my trees. And she's, you know, gets good fruit. What so kind I'm of soil is this planted on? In. So they're on a berm and it's sandy loam. Okay. And what's below the sandy loam? Oh, old lawn. 
you know, yucky clay. What? Okay. Whatever was there. So I don't. This is not my own experience. But what what I have heard people talk about is when you put sandy loam over clay, sandy loam would drain really well. Okay, and then the clay will absorb the soil. So it'll be really difficult to keep proper moisture in the sandy loam. Um, generally, I think having that kind of stratified layers um, is not a good idea. Yeah, I know, right? The mistakes, the sins of our past. What should I do? <laughs> I didn't know any better back then. <laughs> How big is your good idea is, to build a berm? Avocado? Well, no, no, I'm putting an avocado on the berm. And when she said that, I said, oh, so I now have this berm and I don't have the nifty ditches like Ken does. It's just a berm um, more uh -huh. for aesthetic purposes than anything else. And I says, oh, it'd be crazy to put, I was going to put a mound on it. And I said, oh, how nutty is that to put a mound on a berm? It's already a mound. It's already kind of a mound-like situation. Uh-huh. Um Actually, if you had used the clay, the native clay soil to build that berm, it would have been good, it right? Not be that bad. I would not be here on the Zoom, <laughs> <laughs> but here I am. Yeah, that's yeah. a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, let's see. Deirdre is saying that as long as there is a swale in front of the berm. The water gathers mm -hmm. in the swale and benefits anything planted on the berm. So, I mean, I don't know the size of your berm, but maybe there's an opportunity for, you know, putting in a swale or a depression as we were Good calling idea. it and see if that mm -hmm. will work. And it's very interesting. Right. We put in a berm, but mostly for the purpose of killing off some trees that have been cut down and kept coming back and coming back and back. Yeah. And now I'm looking and going, hmm, now what? <laughs> but at least the trees aren't coming back. Um, let's see, Nori is asking, uh, Sharon, why did you not like planting mix? And do you trust the community compost source or prefer buying bags from nurseries? And is 100% compost okay to plant in? Um, why did I not like the planting mix? So what I found was that it had a lot of forest product that wasn't fully um, composted, uh, decomposed, and we may also not have mixed it well enough with the soil. And so we had a lot of trouble getting the soil to be hydrated. So the soil was just not absorbing water. Um, we, we started using a Rob, Robert Couric's method of deep watering and then frequent watering to just replace what's lost uh, through evapotranspiration. And we were finally, after like about two years, we're finally able to to get the soil around the fruit trees to absorb water and they started doing much, much better. So, so maybe as beginners, we were just not mixing things well enough. So I, and I forgot what were the second part. Uh, the second part was, what was the second part the, of the question. Yeah, it was about would you use the community compost sources or would you prefer buying bags of compost from nurseries? Um, that's a really good question. I'm struggling with that right now. So back when we were in Santa Cruz, so many compost sources have compost that's not fully finished. Uh, so it's still hot compost. So if I buy bags from the nursery, I would prefer to let it sit there for a couple months, three months, four months to make sure its decomposition completely finishes and uh, is cool. Uh, when, when people describe hot compost, it doesn't just mean temperature hot. It also means 
you know, biochemically, microbially, it's not finished. Uh, in Santa Cruz, we were buying um, compost from Aptos Landscape um, mm -hmm. in bulk, at least at the time it was fully finished compost. Uh, but lately I've been in discussion with people and I'm, I'm shopping for like 20 yards of compost. I haven't found a good source near Berkeley because most of them are made um, in municipal green waste facility. So, so like Lingso is a really good source in San Mateo. And what Lingso's website says, uh, the green waste compost is fine for backyard landscaping, but even when, even though it's called organic, it still has bits of plastic and glass and because uh, it's made at the waste facility, just imagine what people might put into their, their green waste bin. Um, and for growing food, they recommend a much more expensive compost, like $150 a yard, uh, that is actually made at a farm. So it's made with uh, the green waste from the farm, uh, you know, some of this food waste, but not, not what people throw into um, the green waste bin, but, you know, but like the crop plants and things like that. Um, and with added, I think, turkey compost, I believe. So, um, but I don't have any ways of getting 20 yards of that uh, to be delivered here to Berkeley. I think, I think we're outside of the delivery area. So I am still looking for a good source of compost. Um, so I Sharon, think you've, you've already it, got a, a response in the chat. Apparently American oh, soil in Richmond is a compost yeah, source. Yeah, I went there right. and um, I, I went and looked at their, really, so you, you would trust that source. Okay, that's great to not, know. Not as good as Lingso. I mean, Lingso is like top notch, right? But yeah. But um, I think I would look at American soil. I don't know how organic they are, but they used to be good before they moved to Richmond. They have one that's it's called organic green compost. Uh, it is made with green waste material, but it is um, made with a more stringent. Uh, process that's certified by OMRI. Uh, what I don't know is how finished that is because I, the day I went there, I stuck a compost thermometer into the pile and the, the reading was somewhere between 110, 130, you know, in that green zone of your compost ther thermometer, which is which I understand is the first phase of the composting process. So I am still researching on that. Yes, I know, I know distal compost at Lingso is excellent. And that's, I think that's a farm made compost and not a waste facility compost. I wonder if that's the same distal that grows the turkeys. It I is. I think it is. Okay. Well, there you go, turkey compost, yeah. Interesting. So, sorry, I don't have a good answer about compost right now. I'm searching. Uh, there's another comment that nothing beats uh, do-it-yourself compost. And certainly for the cost factor, if you can gather up enough materials, doing it yourself is great. Um, yeah. I, I always yeah. thought I, I could never get enough materials. And then I realized that we had these big leaf maples at the edge of our property. And they're not kidding when they call them big leaves because there's plenty <laughs> of compost under a big leaf maple. So it may just be, you know, searching out the right materials locally to, to create your own stuff, so. I have a question of avocado. I I planted um, avocado in May of last year, so it's um, more than a year and three four months. 
but it doesn't really grow out new shoots. It did at the beginning, but it just stopped. It just remained the same plant for at least, uh, I would say, seven months. There's no new growth. Hmm. Um, and I've been adding, like, you know, compost, organic fertilizer, and the um, horse manure <laughs> to, to it, like, and then water in, uh, and the water is good. I don't know how to magically make it to grow some new shoots. If you you have any suggestions, um, you know, I think the best reference might be to take a look at Epicenter Nursery website. They are kind of avocado that's experts. Okay, good. Yeah, that's where I got mine too. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they were actually in the call a while ago, but they seem to have signed off already. Um, but they have some excellent tips for, you know, how often to give the trees the manure and the wood chips and when to stop and things like that. So you might take a look at that. And, and if that doesn't help, I would drop them a note and ask them. So. Yeah, especially if you bought your plant there. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be, you know, happy to help, so. Okay, Carol was asking about oak leaves being used to create compost. Um, and Jason is, yes, really good for compost. Thank you, Jason. Um, we use them too. We, they get chipped up um, along with everything else in the chipper and they make very nice compost. Of course, you have to, a little bit of a problem sometimes with the acorns. Um, because sometimes they don't get broken in the chipper and then they will be more than happy to try to sprout <laughs> along with anything else you are growing. Um, but as long as you get them when they're tiny, they're not too hard to pull out. Any other questions? Well, I think it's been a great, oh, here we go. Another one from Karen. Is Acapulco soil still on Jacuzzi Street in Richmond? Anybody know? Yes, they yes, are. Please. They yes. are there. Okay. And they basically carry the same Z compost as uh, American soil. Okay. So if I decide that soil is that compost is okay, I could use either either supplier. Well, do you need to take pictures when you get the 20 yards delivered? I think we all want to see what that looks like. <laughs> yes. Somebody all right. um, ask to get my notes. I forgot. I forgot. Oh. Do you want to send them to me, Sharon, and I can distribute them along with everything else? Um, they're not very neat. They are kind of messy. It's just, it's just a lot of my rambling. Um, here, Deirdre, maybe can I give you my... So how do I do this? Let me give you my email and you could send me an email. Okay. That'd be, okay, that'd be great. Thanks. I don't know what's wrong with my camera. It's showing a green light. You're obviously ecological. Yeah. <laughs> this is my aura. Right. My aura is green. My aura. <laughs> Did you get it? Oh. Um, oh, they, oh, yes, I got it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, right. great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, right. the cover crop information is really good. Thanks. Yeah. And I, yeah, yeah. couldn't awesome. take it all down. <laughs> wow. Well, I'd awesome. like to invite everybody to unmute. And we can do a round of applause to our speakers this evening, Jason and Sharon. So if you're muted, please unmute and let's say our thank yous and go from there. <laughs> thank you, Jason and Sharon. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for everybody's support. Thank you, Carol. Oh, my pleasure. And in closing, I just want to remind everybody once again, October 8th, our very famous apple tasting. Be there or don't be round like an apple. Um, and after that, uh, in November, 
I think the 11th, um, we are having a class on sharpening your grafting knife. And you right. know, that should be very interesting. So we'll be setting out more information about that shortly. So, you know, mark your calendars. All right, everybody, have a great evening and a wonderful week. And let's hope we get some more rain. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye